Hello, hello everyone. This is internationally recognized Harvard and Yale educated board certified dermatologist, Dr. Dina Strawn. I am the founder and director of a glow dermatology in New York City, and I am a hair expert. I do a lot of medical hair loss mostly, and I'm here today to talk to you about the causes of hair loss. One of my passions and sometimes one of my pet peeves. So let's jump right in. The objectives of this talk are to help you understand the different categories of hair loss and why that's important. Also, it's to help you understand the importance of getting a diagnosis when you have hair loss or when you're treating hair loss before you start out on a treatment plan, on a path. And I really wanna raise the standards in how we manage patients with hair loss. Sometimes, you know, because hair loss is something that's so emotional and people are so motivated to do something about it and treat it, we don't have the highest standards. We don't really think about what we're doing before we take action. And I really wanna show you today why that's so important. So first of all, let's not forget that when we use the fancy word alopecia, all we're really saying is that someone has hair loss. This is something that they knew before they came in to see us. So if after you started treating a patient or you, you, you've, you've set off on, a, on a, a treatment plan, all you really can say is that the person has hair loss and there hasn't been more of an investigation, then you're really shortchanging the patient. Or if, if you're the person with hair loss, you're shortchanging yourself because there could be a lot of reasons that you ha have hair loss. There are primary reasons that have to do with the hair and sometimes it's something to do with your health and that is uh worth investigating so i just really beg people don't start treating before you have a diagnosis i see patients in second opinion all the time second third opinion who have been treating treating for years and all they can tell me is that they have alopecia which just means hair loss which is what they knew at the beginning it's so important so first of all, I want us to remember that there are different categories of hair loss. This is how we think of hair loss when we are examining a patient. And it's important to understand what these are and understand what the significance is. Um, first of all, we have scarring and non-scarring. And scarring means that the hair follicles are being destroyed in whatever process it is that is causing the patient to lose hair. And this is very important to understand and catch because if someone has scarring hair loss and they come to you early, there is a possibility that you can prevent permanent hair loss. Scarring causes permanent hair loss. There's no follicle for hair to grow out of. So, but if they come in too late, it's very hard to help them, you know, unless they have hair somewhere else that can be transplanted in. So first we have to understand scarring or non-scarring. And you can sometimes see that on a clinical exam with a dermatoscope, and sometimes you have to do a, a, a punch biopsy. And another important feature of hair loss that you have to understand in order to diagnose it correctly is understanding the difference between pattern hair loss and diffuse hair loss. And pattern hair loss is really where the hair loss is coming out in different amounts in a pattern on someone's scalp. Maybe it's just coming out at the temples or maybe it's coming out in clean, punched out, you know, little spots, little patches on their head. Or maybe it's coming out on the crown of their head. And diffuse hair loss means that the hair is basically shedding all over the head. And then, you know, other categories would be breaking and, and not breaking. Then in the scarring alopecias, again, this isn't the complete list, but these are some of the conditions that we commonly see uh, when we, we are looking at hair loss patients. Uh, the, the first scarring hair loss is called a central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. The abbreviation is CCCA. And this is one of the most common, if not the most common, type of hair loss in African-American women. And it is uh, commonly, it commonly presents with hair loss that starts on the crown of the scalp and, and spreads out. Um, and it can involve most of the scalp, but it's, it's very common on, on, the, on the top of the head. And 
it's associated with people who have a history of having had tight hairstyles. So that would be tight braids, tight weaves, or very heavy dreadlocks. And it can be something that they did in the distant past. Maybe they had those hairstyles years ago, but it, it sets something off where their, their scalp, there's an inflammatory reaction and their scalp starts to scar. Interestingly, uh, CCCA uh, is associated with a history of uterine fibroids. And what's interesting about that is that both conditions are more common in African Americans as are keloids, and these are all fibroepithelial uh, inflammatory responses. It's a sort of a scarring, a, an abnormal scarring response. And so it's thought that the fibroids, which are which occur in everyone, but tend to be more severe in black women, um, are a response to the shedding of the uterine lining with menstruation. And so this, this normal event has, you know, it's a little bit traumatic on the tissue and it causes this abnormal response that results in fibroids, uterine fibroids. And it's, it's the same type of process with CCCA in that a little trauma, you know, the braid was tight, you pulled your bun too tight, your dreadlocks were a little heavy. And so your scalp skin responds with this chronic scarring uh, response. I, I describe it as uh, like California forest fires. LA often seems like it's on fire and then it goes away, but it can flare back up. So that's CCCA, that's a type of scarring hair loss. Lichen planopilaris is another type of scarring hair loss that we see that um, it's related to a skin condition we call lichen planus, but it can scar and it often starts on, you know, the front of the scalp and, you know, people just will get little spots of hair loss. Um, traction alopecia is another type of hair loss that can cause um, scarring. It's not always scarring. Traction alopecia or trichotillomania. Trichotillomania is, traction is when you have a hairstyle again that's pulling on the, uh, the hair. And so you can get breakage, you can get inflammation, and you can get scarring. Trichotillomania is when someone has a, a sort of a behavioral issue where they just pull on their hair. They, they intentionally pull it out or just unconsciously pull out their hair. And that can cause scarring if it causes enough trauma. Discoid lupus is an autoimmune disease. And um, I'm sure most of you have heard of lupus and lupus can have a variety of presentations. And many people actually have lupus, but it's not severe enough, or they have just vague system, sy sym uh, symptoms that they don't get a formal diagnosis. But discoid lupus is a type of lupus that appears on the skin that's associated with scarring. And often the areas are completely de depigmented and hyperpigmented. So they're completely white and dark. And you'll notice that there's hair loss and it's permanent. And you know one of the clues that someone has discoid lupus is that they have um, what we call carpet tacking in the ears where the hair follicles in the ears seem really de uh, dilated and they look like little tacks in the ears. And then there's another type of hair loss that we more commonly see in the scarring alopecia category called frontal fibrosing alopecia. And this is much more common in older women, postmenopausal, and it's their hairline seems to start to march back and it's smooth and shiny. And as the hairline goes back, you might see a stray hair here and there. And it seems to be associated with some type of hormonal event. And then more recent research is, is finding that it seems to be associated with, with the use of cosmetic products. So there was a study done in England on men because men get this less commonly. And they found that men who wore sunscreen every day versus men who just wore sunscreen when they went on vacation, they call it holiday <laughs> in the UK. Um, the, the men who wore sunscreen daily were much more likely to develop frontal fibrosing alopecia than the men who just wore it on their vacations. So that's interesting. There, there seems to be some chemical association. And then we have the non-scarring alopecias, which, 
you know, are generally a lot less scary because you're more likely to be able to get the hair to grow back. And in, in these, basically the hair follicle has not been destroyed. So the one that we're most familiar with when we think of hair loss or balding is androgenetic alopecia. It's also known as familial hair loss or male pattern hair loss or female pattern hair loss. And you know, this is what we commonly see. And it's important, I think, that people distinguish that from other types of hair loss because a lot of things that are sold in the marketplace are really for androgenetic alopecia. And not everyone has that. So people think that if their, their hair is falling out, that's what they have. So they can just go grab something off the shelf. A, uh, another common type of hair loss we see, which is quite complicated, is it's called telogen effluvium. And that's a, a type of hair loss that can be caused by a variety of things. It can be uh, after you have a baby, like a natural event, after surgery, anesthesia. Uh, it can be uh, a sign of an internal problem such as thyroid disease. It can be lupus, not discoid lupus, but systemic lupus. It can be a sign of syphilis. Syphilis can cause a telogen effluvium as well. And syphilis causes all different types of hair loss, which is another reason it's important to get a diagnosis. And, you know, stress, but it's not just the, the, the regular stress. It's usually life-threatening stress that would be associated with telogen effluvium. And so it's important to know whether or not you're, what you're looking for with that. Alopecia areata is a type of autoimmune hair loss. Uh, autoimmune meaning that the immune system is attacking your own body. And that's often what people use the term alopecia for, um, though alopecia just means hair loss. Alopecia areata is a specific type of hair loss. And that's when people get those smooth little patches of hair loss that um, seem to come out of nowhere. Trichorexis nodosa is a common type of hair loss. And that's, that's usually from hair grooming practices, such as split ends. People who have straight hair, it's, it's split ends. And um, people who have curlier hair or kinkier hair, they usually complain that their hair is not growing. But it's really that their hair is breaking because it's damaged, and so it's breaking off. Early traction alopecia that we discussed earlier, that's another type of non-scarring hair loss. And you think of people, ballerinas get this too, um, where the hairline, there's a lot of breakage in their frontal hairline. They have less hair, they have less hair from the tight buns, the tight ponytails, the tight braids. And then antigen effluvium we're familiar with from people who are on chemotherapy. The antigen phase of the hair is when it's active. And so chemotherapy, cancer is more active than normal cells. That's why it takes over, it grows more, it's greedy. So hair falls out with chemotherapy because that's the actively dividing phase uh, in the life cycle of a hair. And so it's your hair will fall out when you're on chemotherapy. So I'm going to just uh, take a moment to just uh, mention a word about telogen effluvium because many times when patients come in to see me, they may have already seen a doctor who's done a few tests and they're very distressed that they don't know why their hair is falling out. And, you know, they said that the doctor tested me for everything. And everything means they probably just did a TSH, which is a thyroid stimulating hormone test. And it's one of the many tests you do to see how someone's thyroid gland is functioning. But just checking a TSH does not rule out telogen effluvium, meaning it, if your TSH is normal, that doesn't mean that the thyroid is actually not the, the cause of your hair loss. There are other tests that you should look at, like the autoimmune antibodies. And I'd say that I find abnormal autoimmune antibodies in patients who are shedding their hair much more commonly than I see an abnormal TSH. And that it's not just about biotin. Um, biotin is very popular out there for people who have hair and nail issues. And sometimes people over, overly focus on that. So how do we diagnose hair loss? It's really just a process. It's a basic routine process of getting the history. You really want to find out how long someone has had hair loss. Is there a family history of hair loss? 
what types of types of hair grooming practices this person has and then you want to do a physical exam you want to examine the hair itself you want to examine the scalp you take note of what the scalp looks like are there any abnormalities redness scaling you want to look at the length of the hair is the hair brittle does the hair pull out we do this thing called a pull test where we make a about a centimeter swatch of hair and we see if any hairs come out by the roots. So it's normal to lose 150 hairs a day, uh, but are you getting more than that in a swatch? Usually it's in a swatch of hair, if you get four or five, then we would consider that a positive pull test. And are those hairs coming out by the roots or are they breaking? And then if that doesn't give us the information we need, then we would do something like a, some laboratory tests. So we, you know, order a ferritin, we'd order autoantibodies. Zinc is um, a test that people really leave out a lot. And zinc is associated with hair loss. Um, an interesting note about zinc, if you are experiencing hair loss and your zinc levels are normal, but they're low normal, you still may have zinc deficiency related hair loss because your body doesn't value your hair the way it values its vital organs. And the blood test is really measuring the levels with respect to your vital organs, your zinc levels with respect to that. So if you are normal but low and you're having hair shedding, you still may need to take supplementation to get more in the mid-range of normal if, if, because it might mean that you, your hair is deficient because the test isn't really considering your hair. You also want to check people for syphilis, check an ANA, and you know, with respect to syphilis, I, you know, I, I uh, not too long ago had someone come in who looked like he had male pattern hair loss on exam, but it was a little odd because it was starting for the first time in his 50s, and it usually starts before age 40, and it, the pattern, it had a pattern sort of, but it was just a little off. And I was really leaning towards male pattern hair loss, but because it wasn't quite right, I just decided to do the blood test, which seemed like I was doing too much, but I just decided to do it. It turned out to be syphilis, and I'm really glad that I you know, paid attention to those little subtle oddities of what seemed like a, uh, a normal hair, you know, normal male pattern hair loss. Um, and then if you're really not sure, sometimes you need to do a punch biopsy of the scalp to um, look for what type of hair loss. And this is more common when um, someone has scarring alopecia, you might need to do a biopsy to tell the difference between uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia and lichen plano pilaris. Sometimes you can do it with clinical exam and history, but if you're not certain, you want to get more information. And it can be very helpful to do a punch biopsy because sometimes people have more than one. So I'm thinking back to that patient with syphilis. Maybe he ha always had very mild male pattern hair loss, but there was a little overlay of something else. And so it just made it a little curious. I didn't use a biopsy to diagnose him. I used a blood test, but sometimes it's not so straightforward. So diagnosing hair loss is, is not something we, we, we just don't put any thought into. So another thing that comes up uh, with diagnosing hair loss is it's really important to tell, determine if the hair is breaking or coming out by the roots. And to determine if it, it's breaking means that's telling you, unless somebody has a hair shaft abnormality, which is usually something you catch in childhood, um, if it's breaking, it's usually an outside jaw and it has something to do with their hair grooming practices. So anything that changes the texture or the color of the hair does cause some damage. So it's important to know, does the patient dye his or her hair? Does the patient change the texture to use a chemical relaxer? Do they use a lot of heat to straighten the hair and blow the hair out? All of those things can damage the hair 
and cause breakage, which leads to hair loss. I find that a lot of these patients need to deep condition more and um, just make sure that they are, they are not, they're making sure their hair, hair like the skin is like hydrated. Dry skin causes inflammation and causes problems, so does dry hair. And so also if it's breaking, another thing you have to think about is there some secondary process? Is there something else going on? So this is more common in children. We notice that it breaks a lot in uh, tinea capitis, which is the fungal infection of the scalp. That's a lot less common in adults. And, and even in alopecia areata, there's hair breakage. You'll see exclamation point hairs. But a lot of times people come in and they're having a scalp problem. They're itchy on the scalp. And in the front, it's often seborrheic dermatitis. On the back of the scalp, it's eczema or atopic dermatitis. And they might even sit there during the exam, scratching their heads a lot. If you see that going on, you really wanna clear that up first before you start looking for a primary hair problem. Often it's a secondary problem. Another thing you wanna take, take consideration of is, is there hair loss in any other part of the body other than the scalp? I mean, we're mammals, so we're really covered with hair other than our palms and soles and, and lips, our vermilion lips. So are the eyelashes and eyebrows falling out? We tend to think of uh, our eyebrows as, as just a cosmetic thing, but they actually help keep sweat out of our eyes. They protect our eyes. And, you know, people will lose, we lose eye, eyelashes and eye, eyebrows with age. They do thin with age, but they also thin with certain diseases. So thyroid disease is known to cause um, thinning of the eyebrows, particularly the lat lateral third of the eyebrows, as is uh, alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune disease. Sometimes people have those punched out, smooth patches of hair loss on the eyebrows, on the eyelashes. Um, we can lose hair all over the body in the same process, alopecia areata, we're usually focused on this uh, parts of the scalp. When the whole scalp loses its hair, we say totalis. And when the hair is lost all over the body, we say universalis. You know, that will even be like the, the nasal hair. And again, we may think of that as like, oh, that's great, who wants nasal hair? But you know, all the hair we have has a purpose, even though, you know, a lot of times we're balancing having hair where we don't want it and hair um, not having enough where we do want it. Nasal hair actually helps, you know, keep allergens and particles uh, out of your nose and out of your airway. And, you know, one of my patients who came in with alopecia universalis, she just said that it was just the thing that bothered her almost more than not having the, you know, hair cosmetically was feeling like she had sinusitis all the time because she didn't have nasal hair um, to filter out the allergens. And then um, certain types of inflammatory alopecia, like lichen plano pilaris, as I mentioned, which is you know, related to lichen planus, um, lichen planus can occur all over the body. It's, a, it's, it's an autoimmune skin disease, much like psoriasis. It can occur, it can affect the nails, it can be in the mouth, it can be on the genitals. So if someone has a history of lichen planus and then they're having uh, a problem on the scalp that looks like a type of scarring alopecia, that's very helpful to know. Another thing that's important to understand is how hair texture affects hair loss. So just to put it simply, straighter hair is stronger and it's the least likely to break. And kinky and curlier hair is a little drier and it's more delicate, so it's more likely to break. And if you were to think about it, if you had a wire and it's just straight, like a straight cable, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no bend in it. So there's no weaker spot where it could snap. Whereas if you get bends in the cable, you're weakening it a bit. And so it's more likely to snap. I think of it like that. And then also um, the water helps keep it supple and reduces the risk of cracking and, and drying out. So that's how it affects things. So when people have straighter hair also, the solutions that you're going to give them for something that's happening with their hair or scalp, for example, dandruff. Someone with straighter hair 
um, would likely want to use something where they wash their hair more, whereas someone with kinky or curly hair would not. So this goes into the hair care. So straighter hair is oilier. The oil can travel down from the scalp, which is the oiliest part of the body, down the hair. So it's not as dry, but it get, tends to get greasier and it, and it requires and can tolerate more shampooing. Kinky and curly hair tends to be drier and can it tolerate excessive shampooing. It needs more conditioning. So that's very important to keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about hair loss and also treating hair loss. So speaking of seborrheic dermatitis, which is what people commonly know as dandruff, but it doesn't just present as flakes in the hair, it can be scale and scalp and itch, rash on the scalp. This is a very common inflammatory skin disease that can affect hair and hair loss. Um, it's an inflammatory reaction to normal yeast that's on the skin and it generally happens after puberty. Uh, newborns get it in the form of cradle cap and that's because they have those hormones from being from their mother that haven't um, degraded yet and so they start to get dandruff like a like someone who's post puberty and then it goes away um, we in some patients incorrectly refer to it as dry scalp but it's actually not dry it occurs in the oilier areas of the body and so some people are not aware that people also get seborrheic dermatitis between the eyebrows on the face really on the t-zone so between the eyebrows around the nose and then often men who have facial hair will get that same type of rash in the beard and on the upper chest and back if they're hairy. Sometimes people even get it in the armpits and on the hairy parts of the genitals. So those, are, those can be clues if someone is having problems in other parts of the body that they may have seborrheic dermatitis and that can be helpful in how you manage them. And then seborrheic dermatitis also tends to be seasonal depending on where you live. So I trained in California and I saw it in different settings than when I moved back to New York. I started to see it more commonly, particularly when it was very cold and particularly in the spring and in the fall. So as I mentioned, newborns get seborrheic dermatitis more. People who are immunocompromised, such as people with HIV, get more severe and more common seborrheic dermatitis. And then people with neurological diseases, such as, you know, dementia, they will also get seborrheic dermatitis more commonly and more severely. Another, another tip, um, if, some, if someone comes in and they're having a hair issue and you're looking at their scalp and you notice a discoloration along the frontal hairline, it may be darker or lighter and they have some hair loss there and it seem, all seems type of, kind of weird, think about seborrheic dermatitis because they may be scratching their hair out they may have a low-grade uh, seborrheic dermatitis where you're not seeing the redness or you're not seeing any scale or rash, but it's discolored. That can be a clue. And just remember, it's, it, it's a common thing that once you treat the seborrheic dermatitis, the hair loss issue goes away. So how do we treat seborrheic dermatitis? And this is something you're going to commonly see. It's, it's worth knowing. It's important to shampoo at least once a week. People with curlier, kinky hair, and particularly if they have a, a style that took a lot of work to do, might try to uh, stretch out the shampooing to once every two weeks or longer. But if you have seborrheic dermatitis, it can be very difficult to get away with that. Sometimes if you are treating it, you can, but I generally recommend that people shampoo at least once a week. And when you think about it too, keeping, the inflammation down on your scalp, even if you don't have seborrheic dermatitis, can help prevent and help um, certain types of hair loss. A lot of these are caused by inflammation, and we, we know for a variety of reasons inflammation in the body is not good. Uh, infl inflamed gums affect your risk of heart disease, and so all this inflammation on the scalp is not good, and shampooing infrequently increases inflammation. Uh, what type of shampoo should you use? Uh, there are a variety of ingredients that are helpful in dandruff shampoos. We just also have to be mindful, again, people with curlier and kinkier hair 
may not like particular shampoos because they're drying. So you, you want to make sure that the whole formulation of what the, whatever shampoo you're recommending is not too drying based on the person's hair texture. We use a lot of topical steroids to get rid of the inflammation. It's yeast are involved, but it's not an infection. It's a, a reaction to these yeasts. These yeasts live there. You're not going to get rid of them. They're going to come back. It's, it's about the balance. We can use antifungal treatments, ketoconazole shampoo, Nizoral, it's, it's normally known as, or commonly known as, is the brand name. Antifungal creams on the face, and even probiotics people use uh, to help with the balance of yeast and bacteria. There was a study done years ago in Switzerland where they eat a lot of yogurt, uh, where yogurt with live act active cultures uh, provides a lot of probiotics to the diet. And they studied men with seborrheic dermatitis and they instructed one group not to eat yogurt. I believe it was for 30 days that they were studying them and they found that the people who did not eat yogurt had more seborrheic dermatitis flares. So probiotics seem to help, you know, as do barrier creams. Um, and again, the skin is your barrier between the outside world and the rest of yourself and keeping that barrier healthy affects its ability to function as an immune organ and what types of organisms uh, thrive there and the immune response you have. That affects, that'll affect seborrheic dermatitis because it is a disease where it's, it's about balance between the environment, this yeast that lives on us and the, and, you know, the weather. And another thing you can do, relocate in some, some environments, you're less likely to get seborrheic dermatitis flares, but that's probably a big, big thing to do for just for seborrheic dermatitis. And just so you know, there are other things that happen on the scalp, other conditions that happen in the scalp that can look like seborrheic dermatitis that are different. One that commonly people think they have, which they don't, is psoriasis. And psoriasis is an autoimmune skin disease that can affect you know, many other organs and it can cause arthritis, it increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. It's actually quite serious. And a lot of times people think they have psoriasis because it's a, it's a more known condition. And, and thank God for them, they don't. Uh, but psoriasis just looks a little different. They're both red scaly conditions that can appear on the scalp. But, you know, find out about family history of psoriasis, see if they have psoriasis anywhere else on the body. But some people do have just scalp psoriasis. If the, the, the involved area is really well demarcated, red, and the, the scale is different, Seborrheic dermatitis tends to have this sort of greasy scale, whereas the psoriasis scale tends to be this silvery, dry, flaky scale. That would make you think more psoriasis. And then even atopic dermatitis, or what we think of as eczema, just eczema can affect the scalp. And what I've seen is that people who have scalp eczema, and again, that's a often red scaly rash on the scalp, they tend to have it more on the back of the head, back of the scalp, and it's often more chronic. They've been scratching it a lot, and so I see a lot more lichenified or thickened skin with scalp eczema, but seborrheic dermatitis I see more on the front, eczema more on the back, and psoriasis can be pretty much anywhere. So those are the things that are important to distinguish, and again, if someone has a history of eczema, that might be more of a clue that what they have is eczema and not seborrheic dermatitis. Another thing that's important to know, people often come in requesting injections for their hair loss, these, this magic injection that we're going to do that will make their hair grow back. And, you know, often in treating people who have any type of inflammatory alopecia, we use steroids because steroids are anti-inflammatory. But how the steroids are working is that they are getting rid of the inflammation that is damaging the hair follicle and preventing the hair from growing. The steroids themselves are not causing hair growth. So I think it's important that people understand that because some patients even get angry if you're not going to do steroid injections because they think this, the injection is what is making their hair grow. And if they don't have inflammation as the cause of their hair loss, then the steroid is not going to help them. It's just going to 
be painful for no reason. Another pearl is that blood tests do not rule out hair loss. You know, there's no magic blood test that, that tells you whether or not or tells you what is causing someone's hair loss. It's all done in the context of the history, the physical, and um, the pattern. So just, I bring this up because a lot of patients come in and they've seen their primary care doctor and they had a thyroid stimulating hormone test and the TSH and it was normal. So they're like, oh, it's not my thyroid. Oh, you know, we don't know what it is. We've tested everything. Um, you have to put it in the context of. So someone can have a normal TSH and still have hair loss that is related to a thyroid condition. If they have autoimmune thyroid disease, but they're not, their thyroid function has not been affected by the severity of their disease at the, at the time that you're checking it. So one of the important things I know when someone has their hair, their hair is coming out, they're very motivated to do something. We are very much a do, do something about it type of society, culture, but we really have to stop and think about and determine, determine what's going on before we go racing off down a path. So I'm leaving you with this quote from Abraham Lincoln. It's one of my favorite quotes. It says, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. And I'd say sharpening the ax is getting a diagnosis. And when you get the right diagnosis, things can be easy because you can know what you need to correct. Or if it's going to be you know, more work, then at least you're doing the correct work and you're not wasting your time. So my quote is just get a diagnosis before you start treating hair loss. And thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can uh, visit my website, aglowdermatology.com and you know, contact me at my office. It was my pleasure.